And the only thing that's not got a price on this estate for me is is my wife. Welcome to the world of Britain's top supercar dealer, Tom Hartley. And you're renowned for working seven days a week. You're talking to somebody who actually gets out of bed in the morning as soon as I go in the shower, I'm thinking about the next deal. Tom has traded more than five billion pounds worth of motors, including a record 250 million pounds last year alone. Schools teach kids nowadays how to retire at 60 instead of make, being millionaires at 20. I was so eager to get there where I wanted to be in life. I, I, I broke the law pretty much just think I've sold that white Cullinan whilst we've been doing this podcast. Hi guys, welcome back to Strike It Big. Today we're joined with the Hartleys who have collectively sold over $4 billion worth of supercars. Welcome to the podcast. Woohoo! <laughs> and thanks for inviting us down. One of the things we find really intriguing about your business is it's a father-son setup, which is similar to myself and Curtis. So could you uh, perhaps talk us a bit about that, Tom, and how that dynamic works? Yeah, it's um, obviously in the earlier days, there was myself who started off. And then um, uh, I've got two sons, Tom and Carl. And uh, as we talked about earlier they were educated in this business and uh, they always worked on a commission basis as, as teenagers kids and they bought their way into the business and uh, Carl's a full 50% uh, shareholder of this business and partner and um, earned it rightly so. So how does that dynamic work Carl? Well obviously over the last I mean I've been involved in this business for 20 years now um, or maybe a touch more. And um, over the last 20 years, the world has changed a lot, especially the car business. What with, you know, I remember when, I remember when we first launched our, our website, you know, and um, it was a big change. Mm. And from that now to, to social media has become an even bigger change, which is the way of the world. And um, the business has grown and grown and grown and grown and grown. And um, you need someone or an, an age of someone who is very in touch, you know, bringing the business into the future, which is um, what I think I brought to the business. And my dad along the way, he, he's picked up very quickly. <laughs> he's a fantastic marketer. He's picked up very quickly. And um, together, we, um, we're the dream team. Do you ever have any arguments? Because I know me and my dad argue a lot when it comes to social media and what's the best ways to approach things. And they're very constructive in the end because we're both trying to fix the issue, but coming at it from different ages. How does that work with you guys? Um, we don't we don't really argue over business. We don't really argue at all to an extent because you know you just we. we I think I feel we think the same way or very mm. similar. So if I think something's the wrong idea, he already thinks it anyway. Mm. Um, but in regards to social media, so obviously my dad is a 62 year old Scotchman. So he's very old fashioned in the, the, his way with words and his way with, you know, how he, his opinions. And in today's day and age, you have to be so careful with, you know, you can offend everybody mm. and anybody by saying anything. This is what I say to dad. You could, you could say good morning in the wrong tone and <laughs> somebody think, gets offended by it. I think one of you guys touched on it earlier. The point Carl's making, I'm very much old school, but I'm very much me mm. and I'm very raw mm. in, in social media. And, and people love that. Yeah. People yeah. actually, you with know, the, people, with, with you're never going to please everybody. You never, hmm. you're never going to please Peter and Paul, whatever you do in life. Mm. There's nobody has got Peter and Paul and they're both are happy. So everybody's got a downside to an upside. But for me, I, I'm me and I say it as I say it. Mm. If it upsets people, it upsets them. If it doesn't, you know, it doesn't. And, um, and I take it as it comes. Yeah. I think people know where they stand when you've got that attitude towards life as well. They know you're truthful and you're coming with it, with with good intentions. I say it as it is, and I find um, um, MD knows anything about myself. Uh, I'm not a flamboyant person. I'm very much uh, a set of golf clubs, a nice meal, a glass of wine. That suits me fine. I don't want a private jet. I don't want a yacht. Um, it's, it's, not my, it's not what I'm made of. Since when you were very young at school, were you always that way? Did you just say your opinion and you didn't care what anyone else thought? I think it's in the genes. I think my family, uh, yeah, I think um, I've got a daughter, an older daughter, Priscilla, who's just got married. She's very much like that. And Carlos, to be honest with you, he, he, Carl and Priscilla in particular, my, my children are very much like me with my personality. Mm. Let's see as it is. So I understand you left school at 11 years old. Um, how did that go down with the parents? And uh, a lot of people think that's quite a shocking thing to leave at uh, 11 years old. 
They were like my cultures of uh, Romani culture, and that's what we do. Um, you know, my father done the same thing uh, at his age, and we help out. It's it's very interesting because, well, my family in particular, my children, uh, two sons in particular, weren't learning a lot at school. Uh, and as it so happens, the father happened to be in in the supercar business, so nine people out of ten would like that to be the case mm. with their family. I would imagine uh, being being boys, so. Um, I structured an education plan, which which uh, they, they followed and they studied. And uh, back in the 80s to do such a thing, it was like I was appearing on TV shows like Esther Ranson, Kilroy, debate shows, and like I was, I was doing something illegal. Mm. Well, I really wasn't. And as times developed and where we stand today, uh, the government are encouraging young kids to be young entrepreneurs, 11, 12 year old. I've done that with my children 30 years ago, 25 years ago. Yeah, I see that. The world has changed but, a lot but, since then. But what since, happened, since I was when we left school. Of course it is, Carl. But going back even further again, the question you asked me about mm. me, that was a way of life for me. That's that's what I did. And that's that's, that's how I was educated. As, as 11, 12-year-old, a 13-year-old, I really, it, full, it was in full flow. So can you remember the first car you ever sold and how old you were at that time? Yes, it was a Range Rover um, and it was uh, 1971. They'd just come out. It was nineteen hundred and forty pounds when it came out, and uh, a relative called um, Billy Barty um, sold it to me. And uh, it's all in my autobiography, the deal maker, all this stuff. It's uh, it tells how the journey started, and it was purely. I'm not going to say the word fluke because you make your own luck in business, mm. as my father would say. Uh, he happened to have a relative who wanted to buy one, and I overheard a conversation of a guy who just take delivery of one. So I married and manipulated the deal together. And I think I earned 250 pounds and 250 pounds in 1971. Wow. So you were picking up on all of those conversations and making the deals even back then. Yeah, but my father was the sort of guy, he never, he, although he was in the carpet business, he changed his car three or four times a year. So I'd watch how he'd do that. Mm. And, and what was very important to me uh, from the age of six or seven year old, I'd be in the carpet shops watching my parents deal with customers. And by the age, by the time I was nine or 10, I was actually talking to customers. And that's very important to have the confidence. And I see it in my grandchildren now, uh, Carl's kids in particular, uh, Isla and uh, uh, my, my granddaughter, she's, uh, how old is Isla? Uh, five. Five, and she's got the confidence, you know, to, and it's very important for kids at that age to have the confidence to talk to somebody and look at them in the eye. I'd rather be shy and sit in a corner. I don't, you know, kid, schools teach kids nowadays, or, or they have been for the years, how to retire at 60 instead of make, being millionaires at 20. Yeah. That's the difference. That's my philosophy in life. They should be portraying them. And when I lecture here once a month to different schools, that same is, that's, I'm never going to be a school teacher, but I'll try and teach what school teachers can't, that if they've got a dream, they should chase it and they, and they can they can achieve it if they want it bad enough. So what was it like for you, Carl, leaving at 11 as well? Because obviously you did it in a different time, mm -hmm. um, both from uh, your friends and also your perspective of it as well. Yeah, so like like my dad just said a minute ago, when I remember when I left school um, at a young age, it was kind of frowned upon. Um, you know, we there was all sorts of homeschooling that we had to do to prove that I was having an education. I was also being educated in the business at the same time, but it was almost like, you know, a taboo thing. It was, we were doing the wrong thing. Mm. Um, and now, yes, okay, it's 23 years later, you know, people would absolutely encourage that now and they'd push it and they'd promote it and they'd go like, wow, well, you know, what, yeah. a, what, what, what a, a young individual, he's leaving school, he wants to get into business and There's they many would promote YouTubers it. that just of course. Yeah, drop out of school and do their YouTube channel. People, people drop out of school and they're not, um, you know, buying and selling a commodity or, 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 or you, you know, working in a company. They're, they're, they're documenting their life and, and playing a PlayStation maybe and becoming a gamer and mm. earning what, what, money from that. What's you know? important for, for viewers to understand here and let me make this clear, my children didn't, didn't go to school to come play football every day of the week. Yeah, mm. they weren't doing that. There was a there was a there was a part of the program where they did have sport. They happened to be golfers and good golfers. Sounds good to me. But <laughs> but but you know, watching CNN news, reading the Times newspaper, being in the accounts department, and when they used to learn geography, they they, they weren't showed Stratford upon Avon on a blackboard. Mm. This is where you know Stratford and Avon is Shakespeare's mm. country. Mm. I'd take them there. Mm. I'd be buying a car there. And see, by the way, we're just having Stratford. This is this is Stratford, mm. or this is Kent, or this is Scotland. But it was it was a situation where, um, for me personally, school. I felt like 
um, it was I wasn't really getting anywhere. I was wasting time in, in an extent. I used to go to school, come back, and when I came back all day long, all I'd think about was, you know, I wonder what my dad's been doing today. I wonder if we had any new cars in. I wonder if he sold any cars today. And I'd come back and have a few hours in the showroom and just just watch, watch and listen, really. Yeah, it sounds so familiar to me because I had a very similar experience of that. I, I physically couldn't leave till I was 16, but I could not wait to get out the door. You know, it was, a, it was an amazing experience, waving goodbye to the school to be able to get, make your mark on the on the world, as it were. Don't get me wrong. If, if Obviously, if you want to become a neurosurgeon, um, then you have to go through the, the process of mm. the school, university, college, get your degrees. And, and you know, I don't, I don't want a neurosurgeon to be operating on me who left school when he was 12. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I had a classroom here last week from William Alley, it's a local school, state school. And the headmaster told me, the, the biggest problem we've got in school is these kids, because they're in the countryside, they're not in the city, they're not motivated, they've got no ambition. And, and I done a lecture with them and said, look, you know, these are 16 year old, by the way. I was married mm. when I was 18. I was a father when I was 20. And I was well established in business as a teenager. Mm. You know, and I asked them what, what the, half of them didn't know what they were gonna be doing at 16. And I tried to say, look, we, you, as far as I'm concerned, I believe 11 or 12 year old has a vision or an idea of what they want to become. Yeah. And that's when they should be starting to, to focus on that. It's definitely by 16, they're on the way. Yeah. Being 16, not know what you want to do in life. That's a problem. Mm. As far as I'm concerned, that's a big problem. What do you think one of the biggest issues is with the next generation? Are they very different from how you were when you were younger? Yeah, like Carl said, things have changed. It's been a changing world. And it's it, the great thing about this family business is exactly what Carl said. I've got my old ways and I've got my own routine. Um, I'm a computer illiterate. I don't use a computer. I've never used a computer in my life. Uh, I, I just about can read. Um, but to understand how... You can count okay though. Uh, yeah, count fine. <laughs> I the, hope so with this the, amount of the, uh, stock. The, the, develop, the, development, the development in how things change and how you have to change with them. Look, if you'd have said to me 10 years ago, the connection I've got with social media and what I'd be doing, I'd love to you. Mm. Oh, he loves it. He absolutely loves it. Do you yeah. think that the younger generation are too reliant on technology now, though? I, I think, yeah, that's a good point. I think while Carl says I enjoy it, I enjoy it because the way we market the business is and being a self and being different. There's nothing about Tom Hartley that's normal, nothing about the business mm. Tom Hartley that's normal. We just do it our way. And, and that's what I believe the followers that we've got, that are loyal followers, uh, love about us. You know, there's not, there's no airs and graces. As you said to me, I'm very raw. Sometimes I'm too raw, but that's how it is. And um, I do think too, is the balance to be had in everything in life. Mm. Whatever you choose in life, there's nothing, it's just going to be all that way. And it's going to work because it's never going to work that way. And you're renowned for working seven days a week. So do you really demand that from all your staff? And do you demand it from Carl as well? How does that work? Well, but first, we'd like to say thank you to our sponsor, public.com. Dad, a hundred years ago when you started investing, what steps did you take to become a better investor? Well, I used to take tips from the local meat market. If only you had public.com back then. Public is an investing platform that not only gives you the information and tools you need to make smarter investments, they also have a built-in optional social feature filled with analysts and notable investors to share their thoughts and help you be a better investor. Well, that sounds good, but I'm more into index funds than individual stocks. Oh, I thought you might say that. Well, Public offer ETS, which is like a bundle of different stocks put together that can help you diversify your investments during economic downturns. And coming soon, Public will have art, collectibles, and more. Wow, surely it doesn't get any better than that. Well, you're in for some luck, old man. <laughs> Steady, son. The best part is they've got $0 fees on standard stock trades, and you can get a free stock worth between three and a $1,000 when you invest with the link in the description below. Wow, that's brilliant. Back to the podcast. I've, I've never known any different but to work seven days a week. I, there's no such it's thing. A weird life. It's a weird life for us, but there's it's, it's also a balance in that where um, you, you're talking to somebody who actually gets out of bed in the morning as soon as I go in the shower, I'm thinking about the next deal. <laughs> so... So it's just hard to switch it off. I never think about not doing business. Mm. It's something I've never not done. I think we spoke earlier about having that sort of feeling of guilt when you're not working as well, which I find very hard to get over. And I think you said a similar thing. Well, some staff people are going to hate this comment. They see me <laughs> getting very raw now. Yeah. But what amazes me with staff, not just in this company or other companies, when they've got time or they, they've got a day off, or they, or they, 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 if I take time off, I'm losing money. Mm. in my opinion. So I don't want to do that. However, um, I, I, I'm, I'm changing a little bit. I mean, my wife, the last 12, 12 months or two years, I'm, because uh, we now live in London 50% of our time. 
And uh, because fifty percent of our business is done in London, yeah, he he grew up in London. I'm there all the time. So when one of us every other day of the week or every day of the week, there's one of our firm in London. So if I'm not there Tuesday, he's there Wednesday, Thursday. So we swap around, and and I spend a bit of quality time, and I do have quality time where people don't understand. They'll say, "Oh, he's a work well, He hasn't got a life. He's he's been brought up as a kid. Doesn't know what a kid a kid's <laughs> life is." Well, it isn't that way because I I could walk from here over to the the, the house being on the Hartley estate here and I'm with my family all the time anyway. If I, the showroom was 50 miles away and I was leaving at nine in the morning and come back yeah. to city, it'd be a totally different thing. So we're a bit spoiled for choice or a bit fair to have that opportunity. So how do you fit family holidays into that <laughs> tight schedule? Well, my, as my wife says, I don't, we don't have holidays. I just moved the office. About 15 years ago, I, I, I tried this for the first time and I went to Dubai. It could have been 20 years ago. And I took the archery route, no phone calls, no 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 contact with the business for a week. How hard was that? Well, let me tell you what happened. I, 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 changed, I, I was in a famous hotel at the time called the Alcazar, which is still famous now. And I'd done nothing at all for a week. And my body reaction, I came out in shingles. Oh, really? I looked like I'd been in Wormwood Scrubs for a week instead of in Dubai in the best hotel in the world. The body wasn't used to it. The, 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 every, the nerves reaction, and this is the truth. Mm. I had a shingles come out here. I had to go and see a doctor when I came off the airplane. It looked like I'd been in prison for a week instead of being in Dubai in the best hotel in the world. So you so, almost need a detox from your work pattern so, to be able to go on and, holiday. And, that, and that's exactly how it is. It's as simple as that. And, and how, so, how do you find that, Carl, when you have to go on holiday? Are you a bit easier with it? or You know what? That, as long as I've got that, <laughs> you're all right. that's all I need. I can do business anywhere in the world. Um, I'm actually pretty much just think I've sold that white cullen and whilst oh, really? we've been <laughs> <laughs> See, they're always on the go. Doing, doing this podcast. And doing the deal. Does your partner ever get annoyed that you're on your phone all the time? Because that's what I get. Yeah, yeah. I get annoyed a bit because it's more so when I'm with my kids. Hmm. I don't see a lot of my kids because they go to school and I'm, I don't get in until quite late at night. Um, so they're, they're only over there though, aren't I, they're, they? They're only over there. They may as well be on the other side of the country though, because <laughs> I, I don't see them um, or very much. And you see from sort of from nine to five, this business is a business that we run. We run a business on, mm. on nine to five. From five until 12, we do more business than what we do at between nine and five. Mm. So that, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten o'clock when our clients have left their place of work, and they can now talk about and focus on what their next acquisition may be mm. to do with the car if they want to buy a car or sell a car. That's that's peak time for us. And if I was to call some of my clients now, I mean, the WhatsApp is such a great thing yeah. because I'm you know I'm speaking to three people at the minute, and mm. um, they're probably doing the same thing, but no one knows. Yeah. Um, but if I was to call one of my clients now, they wouldn't answer the phone. You know, they don't want to talk about a new Rolls Royce. You know, they're, they're, they're in staff meetings on Zoom calls. They're, 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 they're maybe in a board meeting with, with 50 people. Um, they're not talking about a new Rolls Royce, mm. but they are on WhatsApp. And what, Definitely. And what, 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 as I said to you earlier, I mean, being a privately owned business, um, um, we have our board being around the breakfast table over a boiled egg. Mm. So, you know, we have no executives to answer to, uh, no investors to answer to, and uh, no banks to answer to. So we we do what we do over a bald egg. I think you're the very model of um, reinvestment, aren't you? Of your of your profits. Well, yeah, that's what I've done all my life. And we're sitting in a spanking new showroom. Um, I've got to say, the best in the world. I'm not going to say the best in the UK. It is the best in the world, I'm sure, for for luxury cars. And we got another showroom just over there as well. Yeah, so yeah. what a place! Yeah, well, it is. We, when we designed this, we designed it. Uh, and Carl made a good point when we designed it. He said, Dad, this is okay designing this now. He said, in 10 years' time, there will be other showrooms like this. But the thing is, it will take them 10 years to catch up. And the whole perception of this um, brand is it all starts from the minute you arrive at the gates, as I'm sure you've experienced yourself. Yeah. Uh, people get that secure feeling, that homely feeling. And, of course, they've got to remember this. Next year, we are celebrating 50 years I've been in the car business as a Congratulations, family, that's is, an amazing which, which stat. Which is incredible, and I've given the car business my life, seven days a week, 360. I'm in here Christmas Day. I'm in here till two o'clock on Christmas uh, afternoon. Well, it's a big family. I'm sure you have a big table well, in yeah, here. Well, yeah, no, not over here. No, so the customers are picking up presents <laughs> yeah. for, the, for the partners or the buying a present for the partners. It, there's, always some, there's always a reason. And 
and we 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 um, promote that fact mm -hmm. because this is a private estate, and and it's a and it's a private thing with even with our customers. I mean, when we have a customer, a customer, most of them become friends anyway, and it's a lot of repeat business. We just have a lot in things with a lot of things in common with a lot of our clients. They understand us. We like to do the same thing as they like to do. Mm. They like to have a successful business. A lot of them play sports. I love sports. Then we go to the same destinations, holiday destinations, maybe stay in the same hotels. And that's why, you know, when I can't remember the last time I went on holiday and didn't do any business with someone I bumped into in the same hotel as what, what I'm in. What's the weirdest situation you bumped into someone and then sold them a car? I was I was at the Maldives of, yeah. all, pla of all places. The Heaven Maldives. on earth, isn't it? Yep, this is incredible. But obviously you've been, so you know, <laughs> You know, the, the island is about as big as this estate. You know, yeah. it's, 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 I think it was a kilometer. That's a big island. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was, it was a kilometer. And there's, how many people are there? 30 couples, maybe 30 mm. or 40 couples. Ended up selling a car to a guy on a snorkeling trip. <laughs> really? Whilst, whilst there, you know. That's and amazing, was isn't like, it? Oh, yeah, I, I know you, you're, you're Carl Hartley, you know, the Tom Hartley car dealers. Yeah, that's right. Mm. Oh, I've, you know, I've been looking to buy, it was a Porsche. I've been looking to buy a Porsche. But, oh yeah, I've got one. I'm on the boat trying to get some service, <laughs> trying to get the internet up to show them this car. And uh, yeah, by the end of the trip, you know, the car was sold. But I mean, that's that's not, for me, I never left that day thinking, oh, that was out the ordinary. Mm. You know, for me, that was just, that's that's just what happens. It's happened a, a hundred times. It happened a hundred more times. Well, one of the famous anecdotes was, um, I talked to you earlier, the first film that I've ever done here with Top Gear was in 1991, 92. I was the first independent subject to ever be filmed by Top Gear. And the presenter was Andy Willman, who ended up being the executive director, mm. the top man there. And when they'd done the film in here, they refilmed um, the, the story of me stripping off at the Holiday Inn in, in Leicester to go to the sauna bath to find the owner of the Ferrari outside. Mm. And they ended up buying that. And that's that's something that they, they relived on camera. <laughs> and it, it, he was just like, the, he was blind, mind blown by it at the time. But it's just what we do. As he said, he, he's seen me do it all my life and he does it himself. And that, that's what we do. I mean, somebody, you don't realize you're probably so different by doing that type of thing from the other side of the table. Mm. But for us, it's the way of life, wherever we go. I mean, only only a couple of months ago, um, I was in Spain with my wife and kids and in, in Porto Banus. And there's a, there's a car with a car cover on it parked outside of a, a rather big yacht. And I'm looking at this car with the car cover on it. I'm thinking, what is that? <laughs> You know, what is under that cover? That little bit of intrigue. Bit of a, you know, it was yeah. a bit, I can, I can, I can smell the make of a car, let them, <laughs> you know, see it. But it was just the, the way the shape was and that it wasn't the correct car cover. And I thought, what mm. is that? Anyway, I took the car cover off, which was naughty. I shouldn't have really done, but I did. And I seen it was a UK registered um, Mercedes SLS Black Series, which is a very, very rare car. One mm. of six. So Jesus Christ, where, who owns this? Mm. So I'm looking, the person who owns this must own that boat because it's parked mm. outside yeah. the boat. So I'm literally throwing business cards onto the guy's <laughs> yacht. There's no one on the boat at this point, but I'm just like, just trying to throw these business cards on. Anyway, three days later, he called me. Two weeks later, we bought the car. Really? Wow. Like, it, it's, it's just, just spotting one of those, those things. things. It's, it's just having that business things. mindset yeah. as you go around. It, it, you know, it, it's just instinct. Mm. I was having a meal last week in a famous restaurant in London, uh, Scots, and I, I never go in there. I never ever go in there and don't come out the connection never go in there i never i mean what well, you must go sometimes have a meal i never go in that restaurant and don't come out with a customer connection there's nobody in the uk who doesn't drive a nice car that hasn't spoken to us at one time in their life that's a fact mm. that's a fact mm -hmm. i tell you a funny story actually although my dad didn't really appreciate the story because he, he doesn't know who he is <laughs> but um i was in a restaurant in um in mayfair called amazonico 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 one of the two and um, I'm there with a guy, we've just done a deal and we, we, we said we'd meet there and have a meal. So we sat at the bar, we're having a few drinks. All of a sudden this guy's walked in with a couple of other guys and I, I, I like music, I, I love music. And it was it was Tiny Temper. Okay. Oh, really? yeah. Tiny yeah. Temper. So um, I was like, oh, that's Tiny Temper. Okay, no problem. Anyway, um, he walked in, must have had a meal. We're still sat at the bar at this point. <laughs> so we're, we've you were a, having a good time. We've had a few. <laughs> On the way out, I thought um, I thought I'd just say hello introduce myself, maybe give him a business car, because mm. I know he likes his cars as well. 
So um, I went over to him, introduced myself, and he, the first thing he said to me, he went, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, um, he said no, your guy. He said, mate, your dad's a legend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, you know? That's pretty cool, yeah. <laughs> yeah you know? So I bet you loved that, didn't he you? He came back and told me, I said, who is he? <laughs> yeah, I'm more famous than him. <laughs> but I didn't know he was, but it was interesting. Yeah, that, yeah. I mean, when he did, not I felt very... I, I was but what I'm saying is he him. obviously, you know, touching social media, mm. he's obviously seen some social media things where he tweets or quite controversial things that, my dad has probably said and mm. thought, you know what? That guy's right. Yeah, that's why having a personal brand is so it, important. Mm, yeah. it? It, well, it's everything in life. It's mm. what we live for. It's, it's, mm. it's what we die for. But there's an even better story than that. He, he probably can't remember it. Uh, I'm in the south of France one night in, in, in Monte Carlo in a bar and having a drink with my wife and, and this guy's got a lot of attention. And I know the people who own this this club. So I said to him, I said, uh, hey, who's that? He's, he's a big car fan as well, the man we ended up talking about. Mm. So I phoned it out to be, was it Bobby Brankel, was it? No. Who was it? Who was it? No, it was Jay-Z. Jay-Z, oh, oh Jay-Z, I'm sorry, okay. just a bit bigger. And I didn't know who he was. And I said, there's a man over here, I said, he's talking about guy? cars. I said, his name's Jay-Z, who is he? Hmm. he no, he like, actually said his name's Easy. Easy, it's okay. I, said, so, I, said, I, I, I no, don't know no. these people. Yeah. So, but the thing is, but the but big car fans. They're in the, the yeah. car fans. They're in the SAS bar in Monaco at this point. So yeah. obviously I know it's not a guy called Easy. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, is it Jay-Z? Yeah, that's it. That's it, something That's like it, that. Something That's like it. that. But a big car fan, and he loved yeah. his cars. And the guy who owned it ended up introducing me as uh, somebody who knows him. And he liked cars as well. Uh, this Our business is a very small network, believe it or not, with uh, names, no names, and people, mm. no people. It's, it's very, you know, whilst it's massive, it's a very small connection. How many times have you sold the same car? So if you've had a car multiple times? Every week, five times a week. So, what that, so it's five sales a week? No, no, no. I'm on about having the same car more than once really wow. yeah 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 so if you look in the showroom here that mclaren senna we've which we've, is gorgeous yeah we've um <laughs> we've had that before we bought it we have a close relationship with our clients yeah and they trust us so they buy a car they have it for the purpose that they want to have it for yeah and some of them don't use them some of them use the hell out of them yeah. and then they want to swap it for something else so we take it back and we move on again and we sell them a car that we've done the same with from another client you know, it, it repeat business. Mm. And that's why there's sort of quite high ownership numbers on a lot of prestige cars. It's not because they don't like them or whatever. They want to jump through the different cars yeah. and own all the different Ferraris or something well, like that. The car business is, is a funny business. There's not many people, if any, apart from us, who actually buy their stock. Mm. So everything in everybody else's dealership is a we call it SOR. So more, it's like most, a commission most, sale. Most of them is, yeah. Well, I would say 90%. 90%. Even yeah. main dealerships, they don't... Um, well, they main use. dealerships, 95%. Mm. Um, so when so someone... Do you buy when, everything or do you do some of it on commission and some uh, bought? It's a very, 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 very small percentage we do on, on a commission basis. And we only really do it as if we've sold... If me and you do a lot of business mm. together and I've sold you a car and you say, you know what, Carl, I'm finished with that car. I'll try and buy it back. Mm. If for some reason you can't, I'll say, well, look, drop it back off. And I'll try and sell it for you, get you a little bit more. Yeah, that you makes know? sense. But yeah. it's, it's, it's very rare that happens because we pay the market. We don't pay below the market value. Mm. We pay the market value and sometimes above it. Mm. And if you're not realistic on what you want for your car, then we won't take it anyway. Mm. So nine times out of 10, people just move on or they swap the car for something else. And, you know, it's, it just goes, goes along that way. Mm. So when to answer your question... It's easy for us to have the same car mm. back numerous times because somebody who bought it from us now wants to sell it and they mm. can't really go anywhere else and have that level of service that they want. They can't pick the phone up and sell it to somebody today. Mm. I knew it would be quite a few, but it just shocked me how many you're turning yeah. at, at that rate. If it's we've got, quite if impressive. We've got, if we've got 65 cars here, I would say 45 of them we've probably had before. Somebody makes a phone call to here, it gets diverted to him or it gets to me. We talk about the car, we buy it, we go and pick it up. Yeah. Mm. And with these cars, at the minimum price is 250000 and can be tens of millions. Yeah. But that's what we do. I have so many people say to me on a weekly basis, I understand how you do so much business. Yeah. The first thing somebody will say to me, by the way, in, in, in regards to, excuse me, when we have automatic emails that come through to the uh, phones, we get automatic emails. Within a second, I said one second, it might be five. Mm. We're in touch with that customer. And yeah. the first thing they'll say, my God, that was quick. 
Mm. Even when we were contacting you for this podcast, it was almost instant that you came back to us, which we were surprised at. But that's the yeah. level of service. That's that's the and it's like everything I do in my life, even my private life. I'm not one of them people. I don't believe in doing something tomorrow. What you can do today, because mm. you might be dead tomorrow. A story. Um, I went out to with a, a client of ours on when was it last week Thursday night in, in into London. I, I bought a GT2 RS, Porsche GT2 RS from him a couple of weeks ago. He doesn't really live in the UK, but when he was back, he wanted to go for a meal. He was very impressed with the service. He's a first time customer. So we're having a meal, and um, he told me he said, "You know what? I understand how you guys do so much business. Like, you know, the, the, I needed to sell the car that day." I needed the money for something else within seven minutes the contract was signed and I was paid and within an hour you'd, you'd had the car within mm. two hours it was back at your dealership mm. within two and a half hours it was on your website um he said I, he called the Ferrari dealer the other day to buy a car and the car was his ideal spec if he could have spec the car from new it would have been exactly the same spec as what they had yeah the price was okay a bit more than what he wanted to pay but he just really wanted the car so he told the sales manager I want the car Send me an invoice. I'll send. You, I'll, I'll give you a deposit now and just get it sorted. I haven't got time to waste. That's the kind mm. of guy he is. Three days it took Ferrari to take his deposit because they were reluctant to sell him the car unless he had taken out their finance. He didn't need finance. He mm. doesn't want finance. He wants to buy the car. He's actually in the finance business. Mm. Yeah. So why would he outsource mm. Mm. at a higher is. rate some finance? And it's three days. He said, I literally had to. Say, look, I'm going to make a complaint in a minute if yeah. you don't take my money. Why, why are they taking <laughs> so long, though? I don't understand that. I, I suppose the finance makes well, sense. Well, because, you know, but... we'll do it after lunch. Or yeah. we'll just, we'll, oh, it's coffee break. Mm. You know, we'll, we'll do it after lunch. Or pff, I, pff, by the yeah. time I call him and make mm. a log of the call mm. that I've made to, you know, to our analytics team and tell them how long I've been on the phone for, I'll do that tomorrow. Or actually, tomorrow's my day off. I'll do, I'll do it when I get back. Mm. Cars should still be here by then. But this all turned back, if you think about how our attitude is, how our, our um, actions are, it's really all back to the beginning of this journey and the story, how, how it's instant and, and it was quick to make progress. It's simple as that. Mm. I mean, if you analyse it all and broke it all down, it's just we react and we respond. So with you being on the go all the time, what is your opinion on retirement? Because that's one of our biggest videos, isn't it? How yeah. to retire in seven years, starting with zero dollars. Like people love the idea of sitting on a beach and doing nothing. Well, I'd hate that idea. Yeah, I, I was kind <laughs> of guessing that. Yeah, I somebody could sit and do nothing. Uh, for their life. I mean, I would hate that would be torture for me. Yeah, I think it'd finish you off, really, well, it'd wouldn't be it? Torture. I just couldn't even think about doing it. I mean, I don't do two week holidays. Two week holidays if you don't work. Mm. Okay, simple as that. I'm similar to that. I find uh, they start to drag because I want to get well, back well, to the to the cut and thrust. We go to Barbados at the beginning of the year and, and like 10 days, when you go to Barbados, you've got a, a day getting there, a day getting yeah. back. Mm. Even so, 10 days is maximum. Yeah. And after after five or six days, I could jump on a plane and come home. What's your favourite all-time supercar? Uh, I suppose if I had a, a choice of a supercar that I, I think is a little bit better than the rest, it would be a LaFerrari. Okay. Mm, personally. Because I think it's uh, Ferrari as a brand. Um, they can all. I mean, Porsche and Ferrari. It's very difficult to separate them, uh, and it is very difficult to separate them. Um, the reasons why Ferrari is better, and the reason why Porsche is better. But I think overall appearance of the La Ferrari for me, of one of the Ferrari models, has, has been my favourite mm. um, today. Um, but there's lots of nice cars out there and they all do a lot of the same thing today. Yeah. There was a time I can remember selling Lamborghinis. It was debatable if they'd start the next day. <laughs> yeah, that's so, true. You know, I mean, that was back in the early seventies. It's just, it's different. Now Lamborghini, um, Aventador's, your wife could take it to the supermarket. Mm. It's that easy to drive. Mm. Uh, that was never the case. It was actually hard work to drive early Lamborghinis in the seventies. Mm. Uh, what about yourself, Carl? Um, well, I'm lucky enough to probably own my, Favorite car in in the world, Go which on is then. a Pagani Huayra, nice. the red one that just just behind there. Um, I'm a big Bugatti fan. Mm. I, I had one of those before the the Pagani. Um, I had it for about four years, and I've, that's I've I've had that for two years now, and I love the brand. We're we're very close with the Pagani family, Horatio Pagani. Also, he recently just signed my car. Lovely. Um, so that was a nice touch. Um, I just love the brand. I love the way they're built. I love. What they start. I love how exclusive they are. You know, that's one of a hundred cars mm. in the world. It's, it's one of four to the UK. To be fair to Pagani, sorry, sorry for interrupting that part and the question you asked me. I mean, Pagani are another level. Yeah. I mean, 
and Bugatti, they're not millionaires that own them, they're billionaires. Mm. So they, they, they are a very special car. But And I'm not saying LaFerrari isn't, but it's not, it's, you know, Pagani is, is it's just another level. Premier League or oh, Champions League. And, 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 even. and, the, and Champions as you said, the, League, the, way yeah. the, the way the business is running and how the guy himself is still so hands on with it and passionate about the business. Well, it's a family business. It reminds us of himself, you know. You know, mm. his son Christopher is becoming into the business now and is, you know, slowly becoming a bigger part of the brand and, and eventually will take over. You know, we, we, we first met the Pagani family 20 years ago. Bearing in mind, they're only a 22-year-old company mm. at the Geneva Motor Show. And we sat with Horatio and his wife. And, you know, I think at the time they'd made, you know, five cars a year, five, six cars a year. Wow. And um, we've we've sort of traveled the, the journey with them. And, um, yeah, so the answer to the question is um, my favorite car is a, is, is, is a Pagani. And there would be, no, there, there'd be nobody sold more more Paganis in the UK. It may be well, but definitely put in the, the UK than what we have. What are your thoughts on the new era of cars, the hybrid culture, and then obviously going to full electric? Yeah, because we've got a test. Well, we've got two testers actually, mm. um, but lots that's not a car. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, more a it's, it's not a though, microwave. <laughs> a quick story I'll tell you. Uh, he'll remember this. Two years ago, maybe two and a half years ago, we had the first um, Taycan Turbo delivered in the UK. And I went to pick it up. He bought it. And I went to pick it up. And I come back. I don't often comment on how cars drive. And I got back with the car. And I said to Carl, I can't believe it. They drive. I said, you know, it drives like good if you don't mind us. I'm going to take out the business and let your mother have it. Mm. It's okay. Took out the business. Next day, me and my wife's got to go to Bournemouth to, to go to a funeral. So he's coming with us to go to the funeral. The car had 240 mile charge on it, mm. on the car. Drove down to Bournemouth, the summer's day it was, had the sunroof open. When we get to Bournemouth, it's got 40 miles left to come back home. That's not going to do was it. Is there not it? a charger up well, there? Well, the car went from hero to zero overnight. Mm. Went really? to the, found the charger up, not being that experienced with that stuff. Mm. We found the charger at the hotel. It was one of these chargers where you sit overnight. I said, it was around, this is two, only two and a half years ago. Mm. And that's how it's come on in that two and a half mm. years. Yeah. And anyway, he had to phone back to his wife. And tell his wife that we couldn't get back because the car couldn't get us back mm. with the bike. Of course, it was the biggest, it sounded like the biggest load of shit mm. you could possibly tell somebody, mm. but it was the truth. Mm. So we had to stay the night in two bedroom hotels and a hotel for two bedrooms and got back the next day, completely destroyed all the plans for the next day. Two days later, the car was sold. Uh, two, yeah, <laughs> bang. So it went from hero to zero. That was my experience of electric cars. Mm. I think we were quite lucky because we bought a Tesla as our first electric car and obviously the infrastructure is there and for them. Exactly. You know, and the range is 360, yeah. um, which you you can pretty much get. Yeah, you the charge in like so. 30 um, minutes yeah, if you yeah, go to yeah, the right station. Yeah, we've sold Teslas. We've sold Teslas. Mm. We sell electric cars. Mm. But it's not, I don't think it'll ever be a situation where everything we sell will be electric. People want what they can't have anymore. So, for instance, a large engined, manual, naturally aspirated car, yeah. which cannot be built anymore because of the, you know, the, the changes yeah. that you have to make. Um, every car now is a, a small engine, turbocharged or hybrid or, or electric. So like a Carrera GT, for instance, Porsche Carrera GT is a V12. Mm. It's a five litre naturally aspirated manual gearbox car. I mean, sounds everyone wants that. Mm. That is, you can, this is never going to be made again. Everyone wants that. So when electric comes in and petrol cars go out with v, big V8 with a V8 sound, you know, they're going to go through the roof mm. because supply and demand, there's, there's going to be more demand than uh, supply. I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced at all in, in, in 10 years from now that, uh, I think something will, will come along, and there's already discussions with it now about different fuel. Oh, yeah, yeah, I think so as well. So, I mean, I'm not convinced that all that, you know, this is just going to be electric. In fact, as a gambling man, I'm prepared to bet on it. Lots of people say the government will turn off your cars and control when and where you can travel. If the government want to say, for example, right, 70 is the limit on the motorway, your car will only do 70 there, mm -hmm. you know, or well, now like there's a 30 limit being brought in for the roadways that you'll go into it and it'll automatically happen. Have you, you played golf on one of these electric golf buggies with the built-in sat nav <laughs> yeah. that tells you you can't take the, the golf buggy past a certain point and yes. it cuts off and you have to reverse out. Yeah, well, so it's there, isn't it? That, that's going to, it's easy to do. Yeah. It's just a microchip. Yeah. It's easy to do. Um, and that would be the case. Look, what I've found 
because I, I love cars. I'm a car lover. And what I've found with other people I deal with that, that are car lovers, if you're a car lover, you don't love electric cars. That's full stop. And, and Tesla's a swear word. It's a great company <laughs> and doing fantastic things. And, you know, it's more of a technology company it's rather te- than you know, a car company. Of course yeah. it is. They're, 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 they're pushing the boundary so far on what they're achieving to make the future happen. They are the future. Mm. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about car lovers who love a car, who want to well, start a car up on a Saturday morning mm. and go for a drive. You're not going to get a buzz out of going out for a drive. I, I do car. agree with that. I, th- I think um, you've got your petrol heads that are definitely just for petrol. We'd like to hear that noise. Yeah, I, I, under- that I do understand that. But I think you can be a car lover and embrace um, the electric technology as well, particularly when you look at what they did up the Goodwood Hill this year with the electric yeah, car. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's some amazing technology going on. So I, I like the term car lover to encapsulate everything, but still have a, a petrol-powered car in the garage from a Saturday and mm-hmm. Sunday mornings when it's nice and I want to give it a good thrashing, as it were, you know. Tom, do you have a personal collection at all? I know Dad said you weren't a car lover. I, I'm not, uh, I've never wanted to have a car collection. You've never really been attached to anything, have you? Well, I often say on the, the only thing that's not got a price on this estate for me is is my wife. Um, <laughs> well, that's a true dealer though, but, isn't it? Everything's I mean, for that's, sale. That's what I am. And, yeah. and the way she's behaving, she might have a price short. Sure, so. <laughs> Good job she's popped out for the day. Yeah, yeah but the thing is, <laughs> Wait till you know, she sees this. Yeah, you yeah. wouldn't have been that brave earlier. No, I know. I don't. I don't believe. I don't believe it. Uh, no, I, I could never be married. You know, married to something. Uh, the only thing I'm married to is my wife, and I don't think I could be attached to something being a, a greedy bastard and liking to earn money all the time. Mm. That I, I, I feel that there's not got a price. Mm. Everything's got a price. You see, the thing for me is, um, you know, we are the the biggest in, in what we do. And I like to think we're the best at what we do because we do things very differently to everybody else. And we buy and sell the most expensive cars in the world. I think it's a a good thing for people to see me drive the world's best car. Mm. And they want you to love what they love. And I do. Yeah. And I do. And, you know, if I, obviously I work very hard and we do okay. And I like to treat myself to something and I love cars. So Mm. I treat myself to a car. You know, I've got access to 65 of the world's top supercars mm. with four seats, two seats, five seats, six seats, yeah. three wheel, two wheel drive, four wheel drive, so manual, I, whatever. I, I, I've never, it, the point he's making, but he feels attached, he is literally attached to his car. Mm. I could never be that way with the car. And of course, if I've ever gone out anywhere for private meetings, I always take something nice because it is what we do. Mm. It's a bit like the guy, uh, excuse me for reminding people they might not remember it being being younger today uh, Ratner saying that he sold shit jewellery and really destroyed his brand mm. you know we don't we sell the supercars yeah. so to be seen driving a supercar is what I do when I go go for private outings with my wife or by myself but if I'm running up and down every every day I drive them down to Volkswagen Golf Diesel mm. where he just bought his two new um, Defenders so and then it, what for me what I find that does for me it stops complacency because as a younger man before he was ever involved in the business, I'd go by the butchers here and he'd see me driving four different cars a day. And you did, it did come complacent. The business wasn't as big as it is now, but mm. it was fairly big. It's always been a big business. It's always been a well-known business. But I, I felt I lost, you know, the, desire, the desirability to want to drive nice cars. Yeah. And when you drive a Volkswagen Golf Diesel or you're driving a Discovery and you jump into a Ferrari or Lamborghini or Porsche, you do appreciate it. Mm. And that's very important to me. I like, I don't like, complacency is a horrible word. It's a bit like uh, being a steak lover and things like that. And you, you always want the best Kobe steak or whatever it happens to be. And it's not quite as good as it was and you're disappointed. But most people would go, that's the best steak I've ever eaten. Mm-hmm, yeah. So I think there is definitely something to, to complacency Com- Complacency there. is a horrible word. It's a horrible word in anything in life. Mm. Everybody gets complacent. I've seen it destroy people. Mm. I think it's all right as well being attached to something because I even get, I, I drive vans around because I quite like my van and I get quite attached to my van. So I know it sounds ridiculous, but I do become a bit attached. Just to tell, just to let people understand out there how, how raw and how old school I am and how down to earth I am. There's a Volkswagen Golf diesel over there that's 198,000 miles. And you love it, don't I'm you? I'm actually attached to it. There you are. Yeah. Yeah, Black there's Bass, always. Black, Black Bass? Uh, yeah. I'm t- up to <laughs> 198,000 <laughs> miles. It's a 13, it's a 13 reg. 2013. We've, had it, we've, had, it, we've had it from new. It's a 13 reg. We, we, I think, uh, I don't know how many new engines it's uh, had. Uh, 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 <laughs> it's like I, Trigger's broom. I won't have that. So I want them all to understand that I won't have that card miscalled. 
It's a proper shit box. It's worth about 200 quid. It's worth about, it's worth about 300 quid. <laughs> it's a proper okay. shit box. But, uh, I've got, I've but it is, it's, I, you know, it's, I've part, seen it's the history, part of this I've seen the history of that car yeah. from day one. Yeah. I think yeah. I might have smashed it a few times. Yeah. I can't remember. <laughs> did you learn to drive in it? By no, I, I, no I, learned, I did learn that. to drive in a Volkswagen Golf. I've been driving since I was 14. Hmm. Um, I learned to drive in a Volkswagen Golf. Well, you've been driving cars since younger than 14. Yeah. You've been driving, you actually drove cars and drove me when I was 14, believe it or not. Um, but you drove cars up and down here from nine, ten. I think you've got a history of driving cars a bit young and saying, yeah. uh, "Hi, Mister Officer," haven't you? Yeah, you know, back well, back in the days, in the in the seventies, um, it was my only way. I was so eager to get there where I wanted to be in life. I I, I brought the law, and it's not something I wouldn't encourage people to do today. Um, when I said he drove me, he, I've been in private land when he drove cars at a younger age mm. with me in the land that we own in this in this village. But I actually drove cars. I, I actually drove cars when I was 14 year old on the on the road. So did I, you ever get stopped by the police yeah, or anything? Yeah. Well, and, in, in a, a nice supercar. What, what you wouldn't understand in them days, when you got stopped by the police, if you told them your name was Fred Bloggs, you lived in 14 Main Street Avenue in Birmingham, mm. he took that details down, that was it. <laughs> yeah, but Never it's heard of it. The internet, oh, I, you know, I'm not, I'm, I, I see it as it is, as I said earlier, and that's it might have happened to me once or twice in my life. Mm. But um, I was so eager to get what I wanted to get, I had to make them take them gambles and them risks to get me from parts of the country. But predominantly, I did have a driver drive me up and down then, mm. most of the time. But there was times when I'd bought a car and I thought, I've got to get this car back, mm. get it cleaned. Oh, I'm going to drive it. Yeah. Do you think um, breaking the rules is an important thing to do if you want to be successful? Well, it depends on the rules. There are boundaries and everything in life, mm. but I'm, I, I've never played it. You know, there are things I actually watched nowadays. It was only recently, two days ago. I don't know who I was talking to about it. I think that there are rules and there are rules, but there are some things in life that you have to do that are not going to kill anybody mm. uh, in, in order to get the job done. Mm. Um, and, and, and it has to be done. Yeah. I mean, I broke a lot of rules in my life. So you're asking for forgiveness rather than permission. I think it's a situation where, you know, you, 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 get it, you get it all the time in everything that you do where it's needs must in a way. Like if, if mm. you, this is a situation you're in and what do you do in the situation? Mm. You know, sometimes there isn't a, r a right answer, is there? Mm. You just, you just, you, you've got to, you've got to bend the rules a little bit to, to suit the situation that you're in. But, but I'm mm. dyslexic and I didn't find that out later on in life. And some of the things I'd done in my life, I couldn't work out why I'd done them that mm. way until I found out. And it was very late in my life I found out on a, on a, went on um, an examination. There was 10, 10 entrepreneurs in this country that were invited to a castle in Warwickshire. It was filmed by BBC. It was called The Mind of a Millionaire. Mm. And and uh, some of the tasks they give these people to do to see how the how the, they knew how successful it was in business, but they wanted to know how, to, how, how the mind worked doing other things. Yeah. And um, a psychologist, famous psychologist, Indian guy, um, he's, he's very famous, uh, Raj Pursu, and he put a pack of cards out for me to put some cards on the table. He said to me, did you know you were dyslexic? I said, no, he said, don't worry about it. It's not a bad thing to be dyslexic. Mm. Mm. And he described dyslexic to me, which was a lot of things I do in my life, even today. Th there's a Q, A, B, and C that you join. You go to start at A, B to get to C, or C to get to A. I don't see the middle one at all. I just mm. go straight to the, the mm. front of it. And I've done that all my life. I even I do that now. Mm. Yeah, we're so, we're both the same. We're both yeah, dyslexic. both dyslexic. Yeah. So. And I don't read letters. I don't know if you, I, I never read a, letter, a full letter in my life. Yeah, I read the first two lines of why you're writing to me. Yeah, what's it saying in the middle? I'm not mm. really interested, mm. and I want to know what you want to do about it. <laughs> yeah, so I, I don't care what the middle says. Cause that's all the letters about. Yeah. It's a very it's a common thing, isn't it? Yeah, I found dyslexia. mine has um, given me an advantage of being able to problem solve. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a, that's well, like I say, get to the point. Yeah, I don't want to A B C. I want to go from yeah. A and go straight to the beginning mm. or straight to the mm. end. What would you say to some kids that are watching this that have been diagnosed with dyslexia and they they see it as a as a block in their way rather than something that can help them succeed? In my in my opinion, if somebody wants it, can be sport, it can be business, it can be anything in the world if they want it bad enough. Dyslexia is not going to stop them from getting it. Mm. That's a fact. I think in many situations, like you've just said, it can be a gift. Mm. It can give you an advantage. I'm not dyslexic, but I know a, a, a lot of people that are. And it's how you channel your s symptom of yeah. dyslexia into what you do. It's like, mm. it's like everyone's born with a talent, finding your talent and 
you know, using it to the best of the ability. Yeah, it's almost like a superpower in some ways, yeah, if you can I find what it gives you. And I do believe that. Mm. I think if you if you can channel that into what you want to do, you can manipulate a situation so it works in your advantage. That's what I've, I've, I've seen a lot of people do that. So you've, you've written a book, The Dealmaker. How was that process for you? Obviously, you've mentioned that you're dyslexic. Well, I didn't just write a book. I wrote a book and become a bestseller. It gets, it gets used in colleges. It gets used in universities. And it gets used in classrooms. And they, they use different chapters for, for lessons. And it's um, it, Tom said. <laughs> Tom did. And, and what's, um, what's an unbelievable compliment is that... Obviously, he he doesn't have very much, if any, education at all. But he now lectures at colleges and universities yeah. mm. to people who have dedicated their life to their education. They're mm. their, their late teens, early twenties. Mm. They're they're studying to take exams and to to be what they want to be. And then mm. you know they're learning from somebody who, who didn't even go to school. And what's fascinating even for me, and then even Carl making that comment, which I'm most grateful for, for coming from my son, but. I get these school teachers, the headmasters, and like they're just overwhelmed by how the kids react after they've been here. And they say, Tom, we all show you some clips that you, you just, and I, I make sure, I say, listen, I'm, I'm not a school teacher. I can't teach them what you can, but I can, mm. I can explain to them what entrepreneurship is. And that's one thing that you can't teach them because you're not mm. an entrepreneur. Yeah. And they accept that and, and they, they support and they can't wait to get back here again mm. every time they come. And it's a great compliment, as Carl says, Repton School, one of the most exclusive boarding schools in the world, if not Europe. I have visits from, from them and uh, not separating less fortunate children from state schools. Mm. I treat them exactly the same way. Yeah. And I get exactly the same response. It, it just probably is more appreciative by the more state school because it's not as privileged. Yeah. And it opens their eyes up. And only recently, two weeks ago, the headmaster said, Tom, if we lack one thing in these schools, is is their um, their ambition. And as I said to you earlier, I talked about it, uh, it's in putting that ambition to them and that dream. And yeah, that's I, what you need. I struggle to see how um, a teacher can teach business if they've never been in business. Exactly, that's my point. Would you take a golf lesson off somebody who doesn't play golf? Uh, well, I've I had to take a lesson off of Kai, our COO, once, <laughs> and uh, he's 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 uh, he doesn't play golf. Well, he <laughs> does, well. but not very well. Yeah, <laughs> but no, you're absolutely true. No, I, I wouldn't take a lesson off somebody who if, doesn't if, play or could show me how to do it. If if these and nothing against them, because somebody's got to do it and they do it to their best ability. But if you're studying business in school mm. uh, or in college or university, you're you're, you're, you're majoring in business. Um, who are you learning from? Yeah, I guess it's just second-hand experience, like you say, from books and textbooks. That's what they have to rely on. They have to rely on mm. something that they're not the sound sure of. Mm. Yeah, exactly. You know, to, to, to talk to somebody um, who's doing it right now. So if someone comes in here with a quarter of a million pound in cash, we don't is take, that a problem? We don't, we don't take cash. I was going to say, it would yeah, be a, a problem major, a nowadays. Major problem. Yeah, yeah. We don't deal have, have you ever tried to spend fifty pound a fifty pound note in you, a petrol you, station? Do you know what? It's cash is becoming an obsolete thing. We yeah. spoke about that this morning. Yeah. He was throwing his cash away this morning. But, but this morning, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I never I do that. And funny, funny enough, I, I had a call last night. I never even told you about time. Eight o'clock last night. He said a guy interested in in this Rolls Royce, and he said to me, um, Irish guy. And he said uh, he actually said, and it was a genuine call. He said, "I got about uh, fifty thousand cash to come. I'll give you a deposit tomorrow." So don't come here with fifty thousand cash. First of all, said, we don't deal in cash. No. Number one, I said we don't. We would never take anything that amount of money anyway. But you know, some people. That's very. That's an unusual type. It was a genuine inquiry. I mean, we're we're allowed to take. Uh, I think nine thousand. Yeah, nine thousand yeah. times. Uh, but you know, it's it still goes straight straight. But, but hold on, here, 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 you're talking to somebody, right? I grew up. Carrying a suit full of cash. cash. Okay. Mm. I had a briefcase and it yeah. was cash. That's how I used to deal. Pay for cars and that was it. Take it. Back in the 70s, that, that was how I used to do from auction to auction. So the That's helicopter trips with you saying, what's in the bag? Cash. <laughs> <laughs> well, there might have been. Yeah. Yeah. There might have been. All right. <laughs> but, but, I might have owed someone some cash. But, but, the, but in my days, that, that's what I saw you paid for cars. You have a suitcase, you paid the man in cash. Yeah. You know, and, and that's that's what I did is, is from 13 to 18 and 19. But how, how weird has the world got since COVID when it comes to paying for anything in cash mm. now? Where mm. did I go the other day? I, I went, it was a restaurant. Um, and a, a nice restaurant, like a nice pub restaurant that we go to, the Bull's Head. Yeah. And, take um, cash. and 
I, I've always got some cash on me. Like, you know, I'm yeah. not walking around with pockets full, but it's nice to have... Well, you hundred, feel a bit naked yeah, without a couple, bit of cash on your hip. A couple hundred quid or something, just in case, you know, you need it. Yeah. You never know, there's always an emergency. And um, just paying for a meal, it was, you know, 60 quid or whatever it was. And went to give him some cash. And I was like, no, 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 sorry. <laughs> we don't take cash. It was like, like I was COVID on it. Like, like I was offering them heroin as well. Yeah. I went, I went, uh, but I, 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 I always, I always, yeah, I'm still, again, old fashioned old school. I always have cash in my pocket. Mm. And if I pay for a meal, I tend to pay for it in cash. Most times in a credit card, 50 50, I'd say. But I went out with a relative only about two weeks ago. And he told me everything about what we're talking about here. And I was like, brother, it was like a member of the family. It was an uncle of mine, Richard. Mm. And they come to pay for the bill. And you know what? He never had a pound in his pocket. It was all credit card. Mm. And I thought that's the world's changing now. Well, that's that's mm. that's a lot of people now, though. I think I think if you lined ten randomers up and told them to empty their pockets, I think uh, two no, might. I, have, I, don't, two, I don't have any two cash on me today. I think that's the truth. I think mm. that's about right. I mean, but let's be honest. The, even the banks don't want the cash, no, do they? No, they don't no, want it. No, and they're charging you to take it. That's so, right. have you that's ever right. sold a car for crypto like Bitcoin? Yes. Oh, okay. well, that's well, interesting. Yeah. So, what do you do that regularly, or is that just a one-off? Um, no, we've done we've done it a few times. Yeah, yeah, we've done it a few times. We do accept crypto as 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 payment. But um, when so, you say crypto, um, what coins do you accept? Bitcoin and Dogecoin, <laughs> Ethereum, Ethereum, Ethereum. Yeah, yeah, Bitcoin and Ethereum. Only there. Yeah, only but them also, are uh, you using that as an example of another way of payment? Yes. So, we all, uh, him in particular, we we take watches and payment for cars. We've taken art, we've taken boats. I mean, where else in the world can you say, can I was what? Can I sell my yacht and buy mm. that Lamborghini or Ferrari? And in the case with uh, watches, it's quite common. Yeah. For for us to take a, a watch for half a million pounds. Mm. No, yeah, it's we'll, Richard Meal. We'll, we'll, we'll give someone a we'll give someone a Rolls Royce Cullinan and some money, and we'll get a Richard Meal in in part. It's amazing, isn't it? But that's what we do. That's what we do. I mean, mm. that's what we'll do if we have to do it. So, when it comes to that, then just out of interest, how do you then sell on that watch? Do you sell that yourself, yeah. and so, like you would a prestige car? Mm -hmm. So, the watches that um, we, we we take in are watches that I understand. I'm into watches quite quite heavily. Yeah. Um, and they're, they're watches that I value myself because I understand the market on them and I, I know what they are. And like, like, I understand that car. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. so, yeah. And the same person who drives that car wears that watch. So, this yeah. is, we happen to be in a, in, a, in a circle here where most people who drive nice cars have, have a nice watch. I hate jewelry personally myself. In fact, yeah. he, he bought me this watch. Same here. He bought me this watch uh, from a 60th. And and I, I wear I love it I love it it's understated but it's the best it's the best out there but as far as mate goes, um, and and the people who drive these cars happen to have them products as well. Did yeah. you happen to get yourself one of those new Bugatti watches with the V eight a V eight was it or V sixteen I can't remember. I, I sold one last week mm. to to a guy who bought a, a Chiron from us. We had a um a legend edition a um, special car it was legend of the sky edition one of eight okay. and bugatti chiron sport and the person we sold that to now is the owner of the matching watch mm. and that's a lovely watch in it i know it's a lot of money but it's a lovely six hundred and fifty thousand euros amazing isn't it? Yeah. And wow. that's a big there's a big story to that story he could tell you because he was the cause of it the young guy yeah put, i mean this is a story and a half it, it's it, actually <laughs> let's, let's hear it. it it's got it's got it's got, it's got to it, i'll tell a part of it <laughs> I, 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 to be honest with you, I don't expect you or any of the viewers or listeners to believe this story well, I because I wouldn't believe I, this story. I, okay. I told the story to my mother yesterday, and my mother looked at me in the eyes. She said, "Yeah, like that." I said, "Do you believe me?" She said, "Well, only because you're telling me. So if somebody else told me, I wouldn't." <laughs> yeah, no, we had this conversation in the car the other he day. He took a call and we wouldn't talk about the customer, but actually the, the fundamentals of the deal. Yeah, he took a call from a young guy. Uh, he was 11 years old, wasn't he? 10. 10 years, 10 years old. 10, I think he was 10. No, he wasn't, sorry, he, he was 11. 11. He was 11, 11 yeah. Because you told yeah. me, and the reason why I know that, he was just short of being 12. That's why I know that, because I met him afterwards. Anyway, he took a call, talked to him for 20 minutes on the phone, this young guy, and uh, about a Lamborghini Urus. 20 minutes of a conversation, which is a lengthy conversation. And he actually did take, he knew he was talking to a kid, obviously. Mm. You were taking yeah. him seriously. But he did take him Yeah, I'll tell you why I was taking him seriously. Because we get a lot of hoax calls, mm. you know, sometimes. Oh, I'm, you know. I'm, I had one at two o'clock this morning. Yeah, I'm interested in that. Normally, I'm interested in the Bugatti, the Ferrari, mm. the Pagani, something like that. But this this kid called up on a, a Lamborghini Urus. And 
obviously I knew within, well, instantly that he was a child I was talking mm. to. But at the same time, forget his voice. The questions that he was asking me mm. were what I would expect the buyer of that car mm. to ask. So I took him seriously because I was once that 11 year old mm. who made the same phone call. So I, you know, humor is the wrong word. I didn't humor him. It was the, that's the wrong word, but he was a really nice, polite kid. I had a, lot about, to, a lot to be learned from this as you're seeing it. Mm. So a lot uh, to use. I, um, I spoke to him for probably seven or eight minutes. And um, at the end of the phone call, long story short, he said, okay, then Carl. He was a, he was a big fan of the business and watched, mm. watched us on YouTube and stuff. And when I told him it was me that was actually speaking, he was he was quite overwhelmed. I was like, oh, I can't believe it's you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Which is which is that's you know, nice. It's a compliment, you know. Yeah. So um, he said, right. He said, what, what do we do now then, Carl? Well, you know, I, 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 what do we do? I want to buy the car, but only if you include only if you include delivery. I said, well, for you, I'll include delivery. But I'm just sort of like taking it a little bit with a pinch of salt. I don't think this is actually a call. But he's a nice kid. He's very mm. respectful. So um, I said, well, look, I'm going to need some money. So I'm pretty sure you haven't got a debit or a credit card, but if you want to buy the car, get your mum or dad to give me a call and we'll, we'll take it from there. Anyway, a long story short, um, five minutes later, a lady called back and when she got on the phone, she said, look, first, I just want to thank you for taking the time to speak to my son. He's a big fan of yours. He's always watching you on YouTube. So I thought that was about as far as it was going to go. I said, yeah, okay, no problem. He's a lovely kid. He, he loves cars. He, you can tell mm. by the way he was talking, he loves cars. Yeah, you know, him and his dad decided last night that they um, they want to buy this car. So, you know, what do we do? So I said, well, I'm going to need to take a deposit. Yeah, okay, no problem. Here's, give me your bank details, I'll send you the money. Well, you just so, shocked him that but moment. You but then for me to take over from that story, so I never even told him this, the part of that, that uh, he wasn't available when they come to collect the car and they arrived by helicopter. So I met and greet them. He had to go somewhere with his wife and his family. I can't remember. What I was, was stuck in Spain with Ryanair at the time. Oh, that was oh, it, yeah. So, Ryanair. So, 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 so when they arrived, when the guy arrived, uh, and the, the young kid arrived, <laughs> very confident, very full of personality. Mm -hmm. um, the first part of the story, the, the, the guy said to me, he said, I said, it was unbelievable, my son was telling me about, about him buying the car. He said, Tom, he said, there's better than my madness. I, I swear on my life, this is the truth. I don't think I even told you this. He said, I know all about you and I know all about what you've done with your children. He said, I wanted to do the same with him. I thought, I'll just mm -hmm. see how they react by him getting on the phone. That's what he told me. I don't think I told you that, did no. I? So it's he a did. bit of a test. So it was like yeah. a test. He, mm. I swear to God on my life, I said, that's what he told me. Mm. But nevertheless, the second mm. part of that story, second part of that story, he walked over to that Bugatti in the corner. The Bugatti... Um, the Veyron Super Veyron, yeah. Sport Veyron yeah. Super Sport. And he which said, is sold, by the way. Yeah. Mm. He, said, he said, do you like these? I said, well, I'm not a big fan of Bugatti, which I'm not. And I, and I, and I speak my mind to customers. I don't... Yeah. I, I, I tell them how I feel about it. He said, well, and he said, the other thing about it, he said, I love Bugatti. I said, he said, in fact... I was going to go and buy one the other day. It's for sale in a certain showroom in the UK. And I knew the car. I knew the showroom I was selling because it was one of eight cars, as mm -hmm. he said. Four million pound car, by the way. So I said, yeah. I said, well, I, I know that car. He said, really? He said, I walked in the showroom. He said, and I looked at it. And I said, the guy, how much is that? He said, 3.950. And he looked at me from head to toe. And like looked at me like it was like, why are you asking the price sort of thing? He just thought, excuse my friend, but fuck you. And he walked out. Like a pretty woman moment. So he's come here, and exactly like that, yeah. exactly like that. And he said, so I thought, and I still don't know how genuine he is now about spending that type of money for a Bugatti. Mm. I said, I, I know that car, I can buy that car. He said, well, if you can, he said, I'd be very interested. Anyway, made a private phone call, spoke to him, went out to the guy. I'm not going to discuss the figures, but I've just That's told right. you what they were asking for it. Mm. He said, I'll have it to him. So the essence of that story is, his 11-year-old phone call that most dealers would put the phone down mm -hmm. on, okay, became obviously very profitable for us and, and the, the customer got what he wanted. And I'll tell you what, he couldn't believe the deal that we put together for him, considering what he'd been asked. Mm -hmm. So the overall picture was success for everybody. Yeah, it's brilliant. I mean, always. Is, is, that, that, an is that an incredible story? It's fantastic. But, and, and I hope I die on this camera. I'm telling the truth. Mm. I think they will believe you because it's coming from well, Tom Hartley. I, I, yeah. But please believe I, me. I wouldn't believe it. I, I told you, I told my, I told my mother. It's a good story. I, I was sure. telling, my mother was telling me, and I just to talk about deals in particular, and I think she was talking about the children, my, my brother's children were playing in a computer room. I said, Carl took a phone call the other day from one younger than them. Mm. I said, we ended up doing 
like the just over, have, just uh, yeah, four, four and a quarter worth of quarter, business, with, with, four and a quarter mm. million pounds worth of business in about, oh. in about four minutes. And, 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 and the full the full deal, like I said to you, yeah. the car, the Bugatti was sold in in about five words. I can have that car. If you want that car? Mm. What do you think, Thomas? It's up to you. Well, God, you shall have it. Mm. And and the man that owned this the car lived four mile. The original owner. And the man that bought it lived four miles the other way Amazing. from the dealership. That's even, that's that's the conclusion of the story. Yeah. Just to put the icing on the cake. Mm. That's how incompetent the dealer was. They had the seller and the buyer. And couldn't then, do it. But then couldn't the, do the, it. The, seller, do it. the seller sold to us and the buyer bought from us. Couldn't, mm. couldn't do and it. They're in they're in they both live within a, a three mile radius. Stone, is that is that I mean that it really is an unbelievable story. And, and, and the lesson there really is, and I say say this to my staff all the time, never judge a customer that's coming in. He's coming in because he's interested in what you do and you should show them respect we, because you don't know how much uh, we, money he's got, what he wants to buy. We could tell you millions of stories. I mean, we're quite a, lucky though because one. we're quite lucky because we're not sort of a you know, we, we don't get everyone who comes here is by appointment only. We we are yeah. strictly by appointment only. So um, we've spoken to the client who's come in here and we've kind of in our own way vetted him. You can tell on the phone if someone's genuine or not. Mm. Um, so we've kind of vetted them. So whatever they're wearing, whatever they look like, never it's immaterial, you know, it, it, it doesn't make any difference whatsoever. Um, but, you know, a lot of people who are like a lot of dealerships that get passing traffic and you get a lot of people come in and just want to take pictures of cars. Mm. You can see how they can quickly make the mistake of, Oh, he's not wearing a Tom Ford suit and yeah. got a pair of crocodile shoes on. He can't afford that car. Mm. Well, let me tell you this. If you walk down Knightsbridge, which is arguably, you know, the most wealthy area in the world, um, the wealthiest people look like the homeless people. <laughs> yeah. You know, you often don't dress up, do you, as well? No, I'm 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 not for show. I, I'm just me. I am yeah. me. No, but you're you know. smart. Yeah. So, like a lot of people, and even the, the way the, fa the fashion is, mm. you, jeans worn t -shirt. out t-shirts with holes in them, and scuffed out shoes, like new, but mm. that's the style. They're scuffed mm. out, and you know, you're looking at this person, they're, they're jumping in a new. Bag. I could tell you hundreds of stories in my life, and, and that was we only told that story because that's the most recent one. That story is yeah. ten years old. That that mm. story, but it's a good story to be ten years old, and we just had to be talking about it. I could tell you, un, untold. But that's pretty right up there. Only because as I said, it's one of the most expensive cars in the world. Yeah. One of the most rarest cars in the world. But it stemmed from a liberal kid buying a Lamborghini Urus mm -hmm. that most people wouldn't have given the time of day to. If you could only invest in one thing for the rest of your life, what would it be and why? Let's start with Tom. Um, well, for me, it's, that's a very difficult question because I, I only believe in investing in myself. I was about mm -hmm. to say I'd invest in Tom Hartley cars. So, <laughs> so I only believe in investing in myself because I, I know, I think I know, well, I know we know what we're doing. And I said to you, I'm first to admit we don't always get it right. Show me the man who claims he's always got it right and he's a liar. Yeah, that's true. Okay, and I'll call him a liar. I mm -hmm. think that's a very good answer. So it <laughs> brings me on to my final that's question what I for in. you. That's what I believe in. When is enough enough? Well, my daughter asked me that about 18 months enough ago. Enough what, though? However you want to take it. <laughs> All right, okay. <laughs> well, I was having, I was, um, I, I've got another business, other businesses separate from here that are, uh, mobile home parks, residential homes, holiday lodges. Which we could have stayed in last night. We knew you, nothing you could, about yeah, it. You could, you'd love them. <laughs> and um, and I'm forever buying. Uh, we own a lot of land in the village. And like like Carlos, his personal cars, I see them as my personal assets as such. As my car collection, you can see it's land. Mm. And I've got uh, seven, eight parks in different parts of the country. Surrey, which is one of the best postcodes for such a park. Mm. Anyway, long story short, I was having some dinner and my daughter just got married about 12 months ago. I got a phone call off from me, quite a, a big, big deal on some land. And my wife's forever trying to get me to stop doing and buying and adding on in businesses. We've got eight businesses apart from the car business. And my daughter looked up to me, she said, Dad, when is enough enough? And I gave her a simple answer to that, which I think I talked to you earlier about. Entrepreneurs never know when enough's enough. Businessmen do. You know, they, they have a level and they say, oh, that's my I'm, I've got this and I've got that and I can get by and I can do this. But as an entrepreneur, you don't, you actually, it's a bit like somebody saying to you, how much money have you got? Mm. But I wouldn't have a clue what we're worth. I think we mentioned earlier that for an entrepreneur, it's all about the journey. Uh, whereas I think with a businessman, if it's purely a businessman, it's the exit. I've got to get to the exit. I've got to get to well, the exit. Well, it's about that retiring age. I'm going to retire when I'm 60 or 65. Mm. I mean, the, 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 God forbid, I, I should make that age in life and, and, and I hope I do. 
But the last thing in my, I don't even, it doesn't even come over my mind about retiring. Mm. I mean, and as you said, towards business, well, I want to get finished by I'm 60. I was with a guy the other day, I walked up here on Saturday. I walked up here and he retired when he was 50. I looked at him and I thought, how, how can you possibly retire when you're 50? Mm. So it's, it, look, different strokes for different folks, as the man would say, and, and each to their own. And I'm not saying people shouldn't do that, but it's not for me. And investing in anything, I don't want to invest in the brand Tom Hartley. I don't think there, I don't think there is a limit. Um, I think if you would have looked and asked us a question 10 years ago, um, you know, can you see us where we are today? I would have said yes, but that was a long way away from where we were 10 years ago. Mm. Um, in another 10 years, if we've got multiple dealerships around the world, for example, can I see that happening? Why not? Mm, I could see it happening. We spoke about that earlier, didn't we? I, about... per, I personally, I, I personally, if I doing cars, I wouldn't want it because, mm. as I said, it's very difficult to keep control. For me, controls everything. Controls is the most important word in business. It's the most important word in life. You're not controlling what you're doing, mm. and 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 to be as big as we, what we are, independently and privately owned, um, it would it wouldn't be it wouldn't be the sort of action I'd want. So, I'm contradicting myself in one way, but not making a point in another to me it's very important that we own and we control what we do it's impossible mm. to keep that quality of service mm. that quality of attention we've got sales people who work for us on on in different parts of the country and on base here mm. people don't come here to buy from them they buy from me mm. or buy from him it's mm. simple as that they finish the deals off and we can't be in dubai we can't be in new york we can't be in america we've got people who, who buy for us in them parts of the country mm. and they'll work on commission but you can't have something like this in another part of the world. And you're not beholden to shareholders, which exactly. is a great position to be in. I just said to you again, I'll see it again. We'll sit at the, at the coffee bar and we'll have a meeting at the coffee bar, a board meeting mm. or a boiled egg in the morning. That's mm. what we do. And that's how it is because there's nobody to answer to. It killed me to think we had to answer to somebody in investors. Yeah. And PLC why, companies. Why, would, why would we need investors to do that then? No, but it's, it's been able to control and have that quality of service. Can you be in New York, D Dubai, Miami and London at the same time? It's possible. And on that note, if yeah. you guys enjoyed the podcast, make sure to smash that thumbs up button for the YouTube algorithm. And we will see you next Friday with a brand new podcast. So it's goodbye Cheers, from guys. me. And it's goodbye from him. See you goodbye, later. Man. Thanks for spending the time, guys. That yeah. was absolutely really fantastic. Cheers.